Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today, thanks to viewer Wyatt, we have a really cool and unusual rifle to take a look at. Now, this rifle was originally made in 1911, but the story of what it is today really dates to the mid-1930s. And at this point, uh, Turkey had a really just this whole smorgasbord of different sorts of rifles, and they decided to put in place an upgrade program to basically make all their rifles the same, give them all the same configuration. Now, most of what they had were a couple different iterations of Mausers. So, this upgrade program was largely to do things like make sure all the sights were the same, have them all calibrated to the same ammunition, make sure the sling swivels were all in the same place so they could have the same manual of arms and handling procedures for all their rifles. However, not everything was a Mauser. They had, for example, a bunch of Gewehr 88s. Not technically a Mauser, but they updated those to the same sort of configuration as the Mausers. Uh, for example, you will find those with disassembly discs in the buttstocks, even though you don't necessarily really need that to disassemble a Gewehr 88 bolt. The weirdest example of what went through this upgrade program, however, are these and Thousers, Mausen Fields, they occasionally go by those names. There really is no standard recognized uh, nomenclature for this rifle. This is, this rifle is kind of like a mullet. It's an Enfield in the back and it's a Mauser in the front. And this dates, th this originates with captured Enfield rifles from World War I that Turkey acquired. They sat in inventory for a while and in the 30s they were completely rebuilt. Uh, not just to match the sling swivel and the sights and the general furniture pattern of the Mauser rifles, but even the magazines and the chambering. So this rifle is actually chambered for 8x57 Mauser. It has a 5 round standard flush Mauser magazine instead of the original 10 round detachable Enfield magazine. The extractor has been changed for 8mm Mauser instead of the rimmed 303. And, um, in all, this this is basically as close as you can make an infield action to handling exactly like a Mauser. So it's really quite the cool rifle. Now, the other thing that is particularly interesting about this one and about many of these is this rifle actually has a brass disc in the buttstock indicating when and to whom it was originally issued by the British Army. So let's take a closer look at this and I will tell you about exactly where this rifle came from. So we'll start with the original manufacturing marks on the rifle. You can see right here, uh, this identifies this as an Ishapur manufactured, so an Indian uh, Lee Enfield, uh, manufactured in 1911, and it is a short Lee Enfield Mark III. Note that this was pre-1916, it doesn't have the star, so it never went through the British uh, simplification or upgrade program to be a Mark III star manufactured in Ishapur. Um, this is a little bit unusual for these Turkish hybrid rifles. Most of them are actually manufactured on older uh, actions. Most of them were made on, well, most of them were captured uh, charger loading Lee Enfields or magazine Lee Enfields, some of the earlier guns before the uh, number one Mark III. Moving back to the buttstock, we have this very uh, helpful brass disc on the stock. So a couple markings here. The 10.14 indicates when this rifle was actually issued, and that would be October of 1914. Uh, 103MAHR indicates that this went to uh, the 103rd Maratha Light Infantry, that was part of the 17th Indian Infantry Brigade of the 6th Division, and that 12 means this is the 12th rifle issued uh, to that particular unit. Now normally tracking where a particular rifle was during a conflict like World War I can be very difficult. However, in this case, because we know it ended up with the Turks, and we know it started with the Maratha Light Infantry, we pretty much know exactly what happened to this rifle. Uh, that particular Indian unit was one of several uh, involved in the Siege of Kut. Uh, that's a town about 100 miles south of Baghdad. In December of 1915, the British, uh, British and Indian troops uh, retreated to and occupied Kut, uh, and then held out there under siege from the Ottoman Turks. They initially, uh, when they went into the town, they had about a month's worth of food, and they were hoping to survive about a two-month siege before they were reinforced. Uh, ended up, they were never able to be relieved. Um, the, the garrison was ultimately surrendered in late April of 1916. Uh, about 10,000 Indian troops and about 2,500 British troops were taken into Turkish captivity, 
And unfortunately, they did quite, quite poorly in captivity. A great number of them uh, died before the end of the war. But that is one of the two main sources for rifles like this one captured by the Turks. Um, the Siege of Kut, of course, got the Turks several thousand captured rifles. The other source was Gallipoli, uh, where the, the British troops attempted an invasion of uh, Turkey and were ultimately forced to uh, withdraw. Turkey captured a substantial number of Enfields there as well. So you will find some unit-marked hybrid uh, Mauser-Enfield rifles that uh, can be traced back to the Gallipoli operation as well. Now if we take a look at the Turkish markings on this rifle, this is the primary one on the receiver ring. Uh, that TC is a Turkish army mark, uh, ASFA Ankara is the arsenal that did the conversion work, and it's dated 1936. And you'll find mid-1930s dates on pretty much all of these, uh, just as you will find this exact sort of marking on a great number of Turkish Mausers and converted Gewehr 88s. That is when and where uh, this upgrade program uh, took place for Turkey. The Turks also issued their own serial numbers on these rifles. So marked here on the back of the receiver, this is number 1425. That number is also present on this reinforcing bar on the side of the receiver, and also on the back of the bolt. You can see where the original British serial number has been ground off, and a new serial number applied. This one looks like it is mismatched, though. It's close, but it's not quite the same. Now let's take a look at what the Turks actually did mechanically to convert these rifles. I have a number 1 Mark III star here in the background. Uh, just for comparison's sake, that's a standard British World War I rifle. And then here's our hybrid. So you can see first off, they added in this reinforcing bar on the side of the receiver, where there originally was none. And they actually cut a big slot in the bolt head to accommodate it. You can see that right there, as opposed to the original. And because the 8x57 cartridge is longer than 303, they had to notch out the front of the receiver right here, so that this could actually accept a stripper clip uh, of 8mm cartridges. And speaking of the stripper clips, you can see that the stripper clip guide has been uh, rebuilt slightly. So the Enfield stripper clips, because they wrap around the outside of a rimmed cartridge, are actually substantially wider than Mauser-style clips. So they had to weld up uh, and recut these stripper clip guides. This, this was a quite substantial rebuild that the Turks did on these rifles. Looking at the underside, one of the other major changes is that they actually got rid of the Enfield box magazine and replaced it with a flush Mauser magazine. So they went from 10 rounds to 5. Uh, makes everything handle the same, I suppose. The magazine release buttons have been changed. On the Enfield you have a button right there. That allows you to remove the magazine. On the new guns, instead, they have a release latch kind of similar to a Mauser to allow you to remove the floor plate. I have a little latch right here that I can pop with a cartridge tip, and that allows me to pull out a very Mauser-esque magazine follower. I should also point out here the bottom of the magazine does have a little Turkish crescent and some markings on it. Uh, the trigger guard still has its British markings, and this new replacement floor plate that the Turks made doesn't quite completely cover the opening from the original magazine, because I'm pretty sure this is just a modification of a standard Mauser floor plate. A couple changes were of course made to the bolt head. Uh, you can see for one thing the notch here for that reinforcing bar, and then more substantively there is a much deeper extractor on the hybrid rifle here than there is on the British one. That's because this is for a case with a large external rim, and this is for the rimless 8x57. So the extractor has to come in a little farther, since the bolt face remains the same size. It's a little difficult to see inside the rifles, but you can see up here that there is really no covering on the inside of the magazine well on the original British gun, because, well, there's a metal detachable magazine in there to do that job. When the Turks converted these to 8mm, however, they got rid of that box magazine, and so they had to also create an inside magazine box. And right up there, you can see right here they had to add some front feed lips also uh, to hold the cartridges in place. There's actually a little bit of a rear one back here as well that's a little difficult to see. 
but they had to have something to hold the magazine, hold the cartridges in place. Here's the one on that side, because of course that job would have normally been done by the box magazine. Other than that, the bolt and receiver assembly of these guns uh, is unchanged. I've taken the handguard off here to show you a little bit more of the barrel, which naturally had to be changed. The Turks did go ahead and stamp the barrel with the serial number of the new rifle as well. And because of course this was one of the main reasons for the overhaul in the first place, the sights have been replaced, going from Enfield type to Mauser type. Still uh, leaf sights, uh, the Enfield had a little bit larger uh, U-notch, where the Mauser sights have a V-notch, uh, but other than that, not very different. And then a front band from a Mauser, a bayonet lug from a Mauser, a cleaning rod like a Mauser, and a Mauser barley corn style of front sight there. Now interestingly, the import mark, which was put on by Century when these guns were imported, says 1893 German 8mm. And the reason for that is, as best I've been able to tell, these rifles were all actually imported accidentally. Century was importing a lot of Turkish Mausers, and it seems that a couple times people grabbed the wrong crate, and boxes of these Enfield Mauser hybrids came over. They weren't recognized by the people who were doing the, the basic import stamping, whose job of course was simply to go through and stamp this on the barrel of every single rifle in this, you know, stacks of presumably thousands of guns. And so they got Miss Import stamped. Uh, they showed up on the market and were kind of quickly snapped up by people who recognized that they were something a little bit different and interesting. My understanding is only about 5,000 of these were actually done by Turkey, and of those only a couple hundred, maybe less than, could be probably in the two to 300, maybe 350 range, uh, were actually brought into the US. So they are quite scarce rifles here. It really is pretty cool to see, to find a rifle that has both the really detailed provenance that we can actually track, as well as having some really crazy mechanical features like this sort of hybrid system. Uh, again, I'd like to give a big thanks to Wyatt for providing this rifle. I've been wanting to do a video on one of these for quite some time now, uh, and just they're rather scarce and hard to find, and I hadn't been able to get my hands on one. So hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Make sure to tune in tomorrow for more cool forgotten weapons. Thanks for watching.